Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is one of the crown jewels of the Nintendo GameCube. It's a game with terrific writing, a memorable cast of endearing characters, and an engaging combat system that places it rightfully in the conversation as one of the greatest RPG games of all time. There's a reason that each Paper Mario game that has been released since TTYD has been met with criticism for not returning to the formula that Thousand Year Door brilliantly refined. Though not every one of those sequels deserved the blowback they got, if you've played Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, you likely understand why fans have been so confused as to why Nintendo seemingly abandoned a formula that netted them so much commercial and critical acclaim. A game this beloved does not come around very often, and even now, the fact that it never got a true direct sequel is somewhat puzzling. Still, its impact is undeniable as Thousand Year Door feels more relevant and popular now than it has in 15 years thanks to consistent positive online discourse about the game and phenomenal love letter releases like Bug Fables The Everlasting Sapling. Recently, I played Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door inspired by my most recent Bug Fables playthrough, and despite thoroughly enjoying my time re-experiencing the adventures of Rogueport, I came away with a new perspective on one of the game's biggest flaws. It had never occurred to me until I started looking at games critically, maybe as a credit to TTYD's immersive atmosphere and story, how often the Thousand Year Door requires you to backtrack. Though it's certainly more noticeable in some chapters more than others, it's a problem that persists throughout the game and generally feels like unnecessary padding when it happens. Now I understand that any RPG is going to come with its fair share of backtracking, but that's generally because of its side quests, post-game content, and other non-story related gameplay. In these cases, backtracking is usually not an issue unless you're going for 100% completion, but in TTYD's case, the backtracking is interwoven into nearly every chapter, as well as the many side quests in the Trouble Center. However, backtracking is not inherently a bad thing, as we can see in all the beautifully crafted Metroidvanias that are defined by the mechanic. As a tool, it can make learning the layout of the game's world easier, allowing games to do more with less. In fact, when executed well, some of the most rewarding moments in gaming can be returning to an area you've already visited to discover a new secret or to appreciate just how powerful you've become. So what makes backtracking a negative experience, and does Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door's backtracking fall into that category? More importantly, how big of an impact does this ultimately have on the experience of TTYD? To start answering these questions, I think we first have to establish exactly what bad backtracking is. Though I wish there was a universal definition for the concept, if discussing Banjo-Tooie has taught me anything, it's that backtracking is a very subjective topic. The way I define bad backtracking is any boring, tedious, or repetitive gameplay that sees you revisit an area without adding anything of value or substance to that part of the game. Obviously, it goes without saying that what I find boring or tedious may not be what someone else finds boring or tedious, so feel free to make your own opinions. But with that definition in mind, let's take a look at some of the more prominent examples of backtracking in Thousand Year Door to see how they affect the game. The first moment in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door where I became aware that I was retracing my steps multiple times was during Chapter 2's Boggly Woods section. Before you are able to enter the Boggly Tree and grab the second Crystal Star, you must first locate a lost necklace for Madame Flurry, whose help you'll need to locate the tree's entrance. After the initial trek to Flurry's house to start the search, it requires Mario to journey all the way from her house on the far right of Boggly Woods to just before its entrance on the far left, and back again before the ghostly devil will join your party. From there, Mario must head back to the Boggly Tree once again, before progressing into Chapter 2's second half. Truthfully, this isn't really bad compared to what we see in later chapters in the game. That's because there are only five screens to traverse across, and only two of them have enemies to encounter. While it wasn't necessary for the Shadow Sirens to be on the other side of the map, as they could have easily caught up with Mario outside Flurry's house, the developers at least reward you with a boss fight and a new partner for your efforts. Additionally, avoiding combat is made easy as there is plenty of space in each room for you to dodge the sneaky ambushes of the clefts and dark puffs, which prevents you from getting caught up in unnecessary combats as you repeatedly crisscross all of Boggly Woods. All in all, it doesn't take too long to get through Chapter 2's backtracking, and because you were consistently rewarded along the way, the fact that you must retrace your steps several times is largely forgivable. 
Next, after enjoying a fairly straightforward Chapter 3 up in the floating city of Blitzville, the game then progresses to Chapter 4 where Mario takes a trip to Twilight Town in search of his next crystal star. Up to this point in Thousand Year Door, the backtracking has been harmlessly negligible, and aside from the brief moment in Chapter 2 we just discussed, the prologue and first three chapters have flowed with no interruptions or noticeable hiccups. I believe this is a large reason TTYD is not remembered for its backtracking, because your impression of the game has likely been formed before things get bad in the middle chapters. Along with the passage of time, it's easy to forget how repetitive later sections can be, unless it's something egregious like Chapter 7's General White Quest, which we'll touch more on shortly. In the meantime, Mario is now heading into Twilight Town for Chapter 4, which is the worst offender of senseless backtracking in TTYD. Of all the chapters in Thousand Year Door, For Pigs the Bell Tolls has by far the most instances of backtracking, and the first example happens before the chapter even technically begins. Mario and pals must locate the pipe that connects Rogueport to Twilight Town, but when they find the pipe they are looking for, they're unable to use it. With no clues to help you out, you return to Professor Frankly's place where he instructs you to locate an inhabitant of Twilight Town named Darkly, who will help Mario out. After speaking with Darkly, who writes Mario's name on his clothing to grant him access to the pipe, Mario can then finally progress to Chapter 4. Once the chapter begins, things only get worse as Mario begins to investigate the strange occurrences happening in town. After speaking to the mayor to get a grasp on the situation, Mario attempts to leave to find the monster responsible, only to be stopped by a guard who informs him he needs the mayor's permission. After returning to the mayor, we find that he's been transformed into a pig, at which point we return to the guard. He still won't let us through, and eventually, after a quick visit to the shop in town, he has also turned into a pig, opening the way. From here, we must navigate three screens to a room with a fallen tree where we find the storeroom key, before returning to the shop to get our next paper transformation. Hopefully you stopped at the shack outside town to pick up the cursed chest key, otherwise you'll have to leave the shop to go find it again. Assuming the black key was picked up along the way, Mario can now finally make it to the creepy steeple with his new paper tube ability. Thankfully, once we make it to the steeple, there's a bit to do before encountering Dupless, who steals our identity and escapes back to town. Obviously needing his body back, Mario gives chase to the ghost which has him retrace his steps through seven screens before he finally catches up. Unable to deal any damage, Mario takes shelter in town where he befriends Vivian, who sniffed the ability he uses to expose Dupless' secret. This of course means slogging all the way to the creepy steeple and back, a gargantuan 16 screen journey that features the same rooms and enemies we've seen all chapter. At this point, Mario is able to finally hurt Dupless and chase him back to the creepy steeple, another 7 screen trip, before the final fight that ends the chapter. If it seems like I just described the entirety of Chapter 4, it's because I did. Astonishingly, For Pigs the Bell Tolls makes you backtrack from before the chapter even begins until its closing moments. This is absurdly egregious, regardless of how distinct and unique the storytelling of Chapter 4 is, and is a large reason why I personally have a distaste for Twilight Town. It truly is a shame because Twilight Town has an interesting and unique aesthetic that I wish wasn't associated with the chapter subpar gameplay. One of the key differences between Chapter 2's backtracking that we discussed earlier, and what we see here in Twilight Town is the ease in which you can avoid combat. Boggly Woods provided ample space to dodge enemies, which is a luxury not extended to the path to the creepy steeple. Specifically, this one area that requires your paper-thin ability to squeeze through comes to mind because of how difficult it is to avoid the Crazy Daisy surrounding it. Unlike the enemies in Chapter 2, these Crazy Daisy fights can turn into a huge time sink. The worst of these scenarios is when an Amazy Daisy spawns as well, forcing you to strategize how to take advantage of this rare opportunity, only for the Amazy Daisy to run off leaving you with nothing but shattered dreams. It goes without saying that you could always just run away from these battles, but even then the time it takes to escape these fights add up as you constantly go from town to steeple and back again. Another element that amplifies the differences from Chapter 2's backtracking is the increase in the number of screens Mario must traverse through in Chapter 4. Boggly Woods had far less backtracking in general, but it also had far fewer screens which made going back and forth forgivable. Chapter 4, on the other hand, has 11 required screens, with 3 being the lowest amount of times that you will go through any of them. 
at minimum, Mario will have to go through these 11 rooms a total of 50 plus times when all is said and done, with certain sections hitting 7 required pass-throughs to finish Chapter 4. This negatively highlights the repetitiveness of the chapter and speaks to the linearity of Thousand Year Door's level design. However, much like backtracking itself, linearity isn't inherently a bad design choice as long as it is kept interesting. Unfortunately, Chapter 4 fails to do this by only rewarding the player with new content once they've reached their destination, making the journey to get there feel like a chore. Despite gaining a new partner during this section, nothing is altered along the path to the steeple to utilize Vivian's ability. Even something simple like moving the birds you must eavesdrop in town to the forest path would have given players something new to do as they go back over their steps. Without any additions though, everything in between the town and steeple feels like an inconvenience, giving players no incentive to experiment or explore. This is the core of what makes most of the backtracking in Thousand Year Door so frustrating, and why I believe TTYD is a worse game because of it. Chapter 4 is the biggest example, but these issues are present in Chapter 5 as well. You'll set out from the Keel Hall Key campsite and make your way to the Pirate Grotto's entrance to locate your crew before turning around to come back to the campsite four screens away. You'll then head back to the Grotto entrance to deliver Bobbery his final request before turning around to come back to the camp with the Admiral in tow. Finally, accompanied by Flavio, you make one last four screen trip back to the Grotto entrance before the second half of Chapter 5 begins. Mercifully, the path to the Pirate's Grotto is much shorter than the path to the Creepy Steeple was, making the backtracking on Keel Hall Key seem slightly more tolerable. However, once again, despite receiving a new partner, there are no places to utilize Bobbery's abilities outside of combat. Instead of keeping players engaged by leaving secrets along the path that could only be accessed with the Admiral, the journey back and forth to the Pirate's Grotto stays monotonous and dull. At no point do you get a set piece that changes the terrain or path to the grotto, and unlike the novel battle against Dupless or the boss fight with the Shadow Sirens, Keel Hall Key only provides a quick battle with unremarkable enemies to try and break things up. It's disappointing to see the same issues rear their ugly head again here in Chapter 5, including several sections that make traversing the same area over and over again more annoying than it needs to be. At the very least, Chapter 4's backtracking was streamlined because you really didn't have to stop to switch partners or worry about missing jumps that could result in unwanted battles. Here, we see a room that can make getting to the Pirate Grotto difficult for exactly these reasons. This showcases the bad design of Keel Hall Key's layout, as it encourages you to keep using your Yoshi Kid throughout the chapter instead of the new partner you just acquired, because it feels more important to move quickly through these repetitive sections than to test out the power of your new ally. By this point, the backtracking that we've been subjected to has gotten a bit exhausting, which is what makes the Pirate Grotto feel like a well-deserved breath of fresh air. That's also why it feels appropriate to take a little time to acknowledge how Thousand Year Door's other qualities, specifically its writing and narrative, really carry TTYD through its roughest patches. Chapter 5 is the best example of this, as it's a chapter that stands out for its bookend moments more than anything else. Admiral Bobbery finding himself after reading the letter his deceased wife wrote him, and the epic ship battle between Cortez and the x knots are two of the most iconic moments in the entire game, and likely the things most people will think of when remembering Chapter 5 instead of its backtracking. Likewise, fighting your partners in the final battle of Chapter 4 can help players forget the arduous journey to that point because it's such a standout moment in the game. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door's legacy is built on moments like these because for as entertaining as the game's combat is, the writing remains the main focus of the game. In a lot of ways, it feels like the developers gradually embraced this identity as the game progressed because by the time we reach Chapter 6, they've leaned heavily into the idea that narrative drives TTYD, not gameplay. For this reason, I imagine that Chapter 6 is one of the more divisive chapters among fans, because combat is such an afterthought on the XS Express. In fact, there is no combat at all in Chapter 6's first half, as Mario instead spends his time tracking down clues to solve mysteries aboard the posh train. As you might have guessed, this results in a lot of backtracking, but of all the chapters in TTYD, Chapter 6 easily makes the best use of its backtracking. With no enemies on the train, no platforming, and consistently flat terrain, this means it's smooth sailing to get from objective to objective. 
This allows you to relax and encourages you to investigate the different rooms to see what you can learn. For once, it actually makes sense that Mario is going back and forth through the same areas as things are constantly changing aboard the XS Express. It's a shining example of how to execute backtracking correctly in a linear environment, and despite double-digit visits to certain rooms, it remains a fun divergence from the game's formula up to that point. Unfortunately, the issue that comes with Chapter 6 executing its backtracking so well is that it really accentuates the bad backtracking found elsewhere in the game. It makes it harder to ignore and forgive the needless padding we endured in the prior two chapters, and makes Chapter 7's upcoming General White quest feel nearly unbearable. With that said, if you are someone who feels Chapter 6 is an unwelcome departure from tradition, the backtracking may likely already seem unbearable, as it has dominated the game for the last three consecutive chapters. Still, the worst is yet to come, as the General White quest is easily the most infamous instance of backtracking for a reason. A big part of why the quest for General White is so terrible is because there is virtually no payoff. The game requires you to bounce around the many areas you've already visited from Petalburg to Glitzville in order to find the elusive bob -omb, all for a lackluster and frankly annoying joke. It grinds the game to a halt at the worst possible moment as things are all starting to come to a head at the end of Chapter 6. We just learn that Peach is being imprisoned on the moon, we witness Grotus initiate the final phase of his plan, and Mario just got his sixth Crystal Star of seven. Emotions are running high, and the desire to get the final crystal star and finally open the Thousand Year Door is at an all-time high, which is why it sucks to be forced into a pointless tour around the world to revisit locales you've already seen. Like every instance of backtracking we've discussed, this fetch quest fails because nothing is different about any of the areas we go back to. Keelhaw Key is still Keelhaw Key, Poshley Heights is still Poshley Heights, and even though the blue pipes and rogue port sewers make traveling to these locations easier, it still feels like a waste of time. What's more is we don't see a ton of far outposts, which seems like it could have been a charming snow world akin to Shiver City in the original Paper Mario if developed a little more. Instead, we get possibly the lamest first half of a chapter yet, and while I won't deny that launching to the moon out of a giant cannon is cool, it doesn't compensate for killing the hype created at the end of chapter 6. Now, before I give my final thoughts on the backtracking in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, there are a few other instances outside the main chapters that I think are worth bringing up. The first is the ridiculous quest for Francesca's wedding ring on Keelhaul Key. It already feels a bit lazy to reuse Don Pianta to get tickets for another luxury vehicle ride, but it gets so much worse when you are required to sail back to Keelhaul Key to find Frankie and Francesca. Sitting through the I Love You sequence the first time was kind of funny, but loses its charm in subsequent playthroughs, and is certainly not enough justification for Mario to travel all the way to the Pirate Grotto and back immediately after having to do so multiple times in Chapter 5. Next is the process of obtaining the Up Arrow from Merlin, which asks you to go deep into Hooktail Castle. While this is an optional task, it's something that feels too important to skip considering how valuable upgrading your allies is, and placing it so deep into Hooktail Castle feels unnecessary. This is a little nitpicky, as honestly the reward is good enough to justify the trip, but considering all the backtracking in the main quest, I would have rather seen it as a reward in the Pianta Parlor, or something similar. But while I'm being nitpicky, something else that gets old quickly is being forced to return to the Thousand Year Door after each Crystal Star is collected. Admittedly, I love this cutscene, so I don't really mind watching it, but it just feels like there should have been a faster way to get to the door, considering you must do this eight times. Like I said, this is definitely a little nitpicky, but helps to put into context why even if you can forgive some of the early chapters backtracking, in the end it becomes one of the most grating aspects about TTYD. Earlier, I asked the question, how big of an impact does backtracking ultimately have on the experience of Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door? With all that we've discussed, I think it would be disingenuous to say that I didn't think TTYD's backtracking hurt its overall quality, but surprisingly, I don't think it has a major negative impact on the game. Traversal is just one aspect of Thousand Year Door's multifaceted gameplay, but I don't think it holds enough weight to truly mar the adventures Mario has in Rogueport. 
While I do feel Thousand Year Door is a bit overrated and people generally gloss over the backtracking when remembering it, there are so many phenomenal elements in TTYD that more than compensate for any negatives that the backtracking brings. At the end of the day, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is not a game that relies on one thing to make it great. Its greatness instead is a result of the sum of all of its parts, which is what protects its reputation when one of those parts doesn't work. Even in the worst moments of backtracking, Thousand Year Door provides you with something else that you can admire, whether it's an unmistakable aesthetic or a well-suited music track that helps to balance things out. It's why earlier I gave credit to TTYD's immersive atmosphere, impressive writing, and creative story for masking the game's biggest flaw. What I've taken away from this analysis is that as much as I think I value gameplay first, if I'm emotionally attached to the characters or have a deep investment in what I'm trying to accomplish, I'm willing to overlook flaws in the gameplay. While I assume that realizing how linear many of the levels are would lower my opinion of the game, instead it made me reflect on the aspects of TTYD that make me consider it one of the best RPG games I've ever played. It allowed me to reconnect with the game in a way I haven't in a long time as I rediscovered jokes I had forgotten about and interacted with characters I usually ignored. It allowed me to appreciate just how dynamic the combat system is and how fun it is to play with different partners. And it allowed me to enjoy all the terrific moments that Thousand Year Door is so good at delivering. Sure, the backtracking is bad, but there's so much more to TTYD, and if you haven't experienced it for yourself, you're really missing out. Thanks for watching! Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is one of my favorite games, and I was really excited to make a video talking about it. I'm curious what you think of my analysis and what your thoughts are of TTYD's backtracking. Also, do you want to see more Paper Mario content on this channel? If so, let me know your thoughts and leave me a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to be alerted whenever I release a new video.